So this is Blackmore. It's the second supplement to the original set of rules, so-called Edition Zero, the box set. Uh, these rules contained two new uh, character classes, the Monk and the Assassin, uh, a host of monsters, most notably the Sogan. But it was also the site of the very first module for D&D, uh, Temple of the Frog. Now, ordinarily, I don't do, you know, OSR rules as much. I stick to 5th edition just because that's what most people are playing. That's what I'm currently playing. Uh, and, you know, I love, there's some OSR channels out there like Bandit's Keep that I really love. Uh, but I also understand sometimes when you look at these old rules, uh, we tend to do so through rose-colored glasses. Sometimes they weren't, you know, play-tested real carefully or they don't fit the same spirit of the game that you have now. And with these rules, sometimes you had to do a lot of homebrewing of them. Uh, and as you'll see, as written, the Temple of the Frog really doesn't work. But you know, I decided to talk about Blackmore, uh, this module, and some later versions that are more successful. Uh, at the behest of a longtime viewer of my channel, Matt Nerdy, he loves the world of Blackmore. He loves looking into these old systems. He also has one of the greatest internet names of all time. Matt, you better uh, trademark that. And for me, just rereading this module was so fascinating in terms of getting into the mind of Dave Arneson, who I kind of consider the co-creator plus of D&D along with Gary Gygax. Get into that some other time. And, you know, reading this, you really see how his concepts were so influential to me and I think of a lot of other GMs of that period in terms of, you know, our encounter designs and storylines. And I think you can use this module in a 5e campaign with some minor modifications. So, let's put Pink Floyd's Welcome to the Machine on the turntable, get out the old bell bottoms, and return to 1975. And Temple of the Frog. Hello again, gang. K.R. King here, helping you homebrew your own D&D campaign. And in the spirit of that homebrewing, I'm going to be looking at the Temple of the Frog module in the same spirit that I looked at uh, the Dungeon of the Mad Mage or when I talked to Fred Wheeler about the Curse of Strahd. In the sense of, as a GM, creating your own homebrewed material, how can you look at these modules to get ideas, you know, to see how they balance out these encounters? Now, the Temple of the Frog isn't as detailed as Mad Mage or Curse of Strahd. It's barely 20 pages in this little book. But, you know, you're going to find some interesting information in terms of the history and influence of some of these early modules on the game today. And, you know, there are additional modules later in the AD&D world of the Temple of the uh, Frog that I think work better. But, you know, I wanted to look back at this original, you know, just to see, you know, what, what sort of ideas, what could I make of it? You know, the basic definition of a module is something that you can plug into an existing world, you know, maybe something else, a campaign setting that you've gotten, or your own homebrewed campaign. So I'm going to organize my discussion along the lines of the method that I use to come up with a module. So you have the setup, which is a history of the geographical area and the sentient creatures uh, that the players are going to confront, and those creatures' you know, relationship with the surrounding area. Then you have the current situation, which, you know, is the situation on the ground when the players come into contact with, you know, the denizens of this module. And then you have the geography of the lair, you know, and the constituents thereof. And when I say lair, that could be some elaborate keep or dungeon or cave. Then you have the composition of forces, uh, which might be, you know, uh, opposed to one another if you have two different groups, those that are allied with the big bad villain, and you have the abilities uh, of those allies and the big bad villain that are going to come into play when the players confront them. And then finally, when you're doing this, what is the suggested outcome or goal for the players, you know, for the villain, uh, and how is that realized such that the module, you know, has been completed or has moved on to a new stage? So let's look at the setup for the classic Temple of the Frog. It's in a swampy area called Lake Gloomy that is always shrouded in perpetual mist. So you have difficult terrain, uh, whether on foot or in a boat, uh, and your sight lines are very limited. And deep within this inaccessible area, you have a community called Brothers of the Swamp, which Arneson describes as a religious community with sneer marks because the nature of this religion is not exactly benevolent. 
And in fact, you know, Arneson never uh, describes the tenets of this religion other than to say that the brothers of the swamp think of, you know, humanoids as inferior abominations. And so the brothers, through means not explained, have created this two foot long killer frog, they're called, which combines cunning and ferocity. And these are assumed, I guess, to take over. Uh, they've also developed these frogmen, which are half humanoid. They have these stats of mermen. And the frogmen and killer frogs have developed a taste for human flesh because the brothers of the swamp have been feeding them that. So what do you have in your setup? A fanatical group uh, with a goal, which is to wipe out mankind. And so then Arneson divides the cult into two groups, the keepers of the frogs and those in the main temple. And the keepers are very jealous. Those in the main temple have a higher status, but the keepers of the frog control the killer frogs and they can send them out as assassins to anyone who displeases them. So like most evil cults, you have a lot of dissension, a lot of competition in the group. So it's been many hundreds of years that they've been doing this. Uh, and they need cash. Uh, they had this whole plan where they would send out groups of brothers on trading missions in secret to collect booty and whatnot and come back. And then in the last hundred years, they began employing bandits who now live on the outskirts of the temple. But the issue here is people begin to know about this location. They begin to hear about it. And this is where Stephen the Rock, who is the current uh, head of the temple, has come along. He wiped out the bandits and inserted himself as the leader. So this is the situation on the ground when the players, uh, you know, come across the Temple of the Frog. So who is Stephen the Rock? He is the big bad villain of the module, probably the first big bad villain of D&D. And it turns out he is described as an intelligent humanoid from another planet slash dimension. And presumably if it's a dimension, there's a world there because he was sent with three other companions because in this area, just coincidentally, where the Brothers of the Swamp created their temple, there's the classic nexus point between dimensions. They were sent there by their civilization to watch over this and to collect loot and bring it back. But Stephen, when he saw what was going on, he saw an opportunity here. He killed two of his companions and then bribed the other one by making him uh, basically the you know, military leader of the Frog Temple. So you have an evil cult who have all sorts of di dissension within them. Then you have this alien creature who's come along and taken over the temple. But of course, Stephen has to be careful because once a year, a hovering sa satellite appears at the temple to get a report from him and he's supposed to give back the booty that he's collected. So he supplies a few trinkets and somehow, you know, they don't know, they don't realize where are the other two guys or whatever. He makes up excuses. And what's interesting here is you have a sci-fi element. This is the first one, you know, in D&D. &D. Uh, the Metamorphosis Alpha a system was out, I think, about a year later, uh, which is the classic, you know, campaign setting, a sci-fi setting on the spaceship. All right, so they also provide, you know, kind of crude by today's standards, but certainly usable maps of the temple, uh, of the surrounding areas in the swamp. You also have dungeons underneath several layers there. And you know, if you're doing this, if you're creating something for fifth edition, you could use these maps. Uh, you can find them online, but you could also redraw them in something like a uh, dungeon draft, especially if you need an electronic version. But you'll see right away that there is a problem here of scale. Stephen the Rock as defined is extremely powerful. And when you get into the number of killer frogs, frogmen and troops at his disposal, uh, a single, you know, standard, you know, six or seven member group or something is really going to have a hard time, even if they're high level of taking them on. So it's been argued that Arneson meant this adventure as uh, having a, a whole army here that would attack the temple using the old chainmail rules. Uh, some people say that's why there's so much treasure. It's supposed to be divided among this army. But of course, he doesn't say anything about that in the text. And the thing is, the players are going to have to confront Stephen the Rock. So, you know, if we look at his abilities as written, you'll see he's a nasty piece of business. So they stress that Stephen has no uh, innate magic or doesn't know how to use spells. But what he does have is alien technology. He has a battle suit that serves as plus three armor. Uh, plus three saves. Uh, he can move 120 feet a turn without becoming fatigued. And it gives him an 18 strength and an 18 dexterity. But there's more. The battle armor gives him complete protection from energy spells. You know, lightning bolts, cold, whatever. It provides protection from any life drain effects and a host of other spells. And it allows Steven to fly and to move and breathe underwater. 
So the battle suit has 60 hit points and can only be affected by weaponry. And in addition, Steven has a plus three sword that every time it strikes another weapon, 20% chance that other weapon is broken. And it has six 20 point lightning bolts every day. Oh, and by the way, Steven also has a plus three shield that works as a ring of invisibility and gives a protection to a whole host of other spells in a 10 foot radius. So he is just unbelievably powerful. So right away, if I'm gonna take this Steven character and I'm saying, well, I'm gonna make him uh, something for 5e, uh, obviously we have a different, I can, you can make the battle suit have a high armor class, right? Anyone puts it on, let's say they have a 20. But I'd have the speed to 60 feet a turn. I'd get rid of the fly and the move and breathe underwater. And in terms of strength and dex, you know, every person that uses it, maybe it gives a plus three or something to your strength and dex. Again, you can modify that if you want, but automatic 18, that's pretty deadly. And the entire the immunity to all energy spells and also all these other spells that they list, you know, maybe you put some resistance up against, you know, certain energy spells, something like that. No lightning bolts on the sword. And, you know, the invisibility maybe three times a day instead of just any time he wants to bring up this invisibility. And here again, Steven, as written, has more technology. He has this medical kit that's described as a 10 by 10 foot cube that can cure up to, I think, four people, uh, including dead ones. Now, it's a very slow process. One point a day, I think a half point if they've been hacked up or dead, but so you're, it's sort of like, why would it be so slow? Especially since he doesn't have, you know, uh, curing abilities uh, himself. And then he has this communications device uh, that basically provides a mass teleport to any location on the planet with no chance of failure. So I don't, because the healing thing is so slow, he would have healers around that he can control. You'll see he has his control rings, by the way. So the medical thing is not so important. You know, the teleport thing is deadly. Maybe it's a fixed item that just can't be moved around because both the healing kit and the module move on anti-gravity devices. Yeah, nasty. All right, so Steven himself has to be modified if you're gonna use this concept. But the other thing you gotta do is the composition of forces because it is in many ways more outlandish even as written as Steven's abilities. You know, you got troops, Killer frogs and frogmen who have the merman stats. And the killer frogs are pretty nice stats too. Especially since you have 1,200 killer frogs. And you've got 240 frogmen. And then you've got hundreds of troops and guards stationed all over, you know, outside the temple, in the temple. And then down in the dungeon, Medusa, uh, Ochre Jelly. Uh, you've got uh, a whole tribe of trolls. And these troops can come at any moment's notice. Why? Because of the rings that they have. Now, this is a classic thing I've used before. I have a whole video in terms of puzzles, and I talk about one of them is not so much a puzzle, but a device like a ring, which allows people access to different areas, and that they work the same way. And Arneson has this hierarchy in which the highest level uh, ring uh, of the high priest, which is Stephen, uh, not only controls all the other rings, but has all of their powers. So the Chief Keeper's ring controls the killer frogs and the frogmen and those beneath him. Uh, the, the captain's rings uh, control those below them. They also give them access at each higher level to you know, more uh, areas within the temple itself. And the priest's rings control the acolytes. The other thing they do is they provide instantaneous communication between all the users. But you know, these ring concepts, area access, uh, control features, communication features. These are core concept of all sorts of modules, and this is kind of what Arneson came up with. But you know, the other problem is there's 180 of these rings. Eh, that's way too many. And as I mentioned, part of the reasoning behind, well, there must be an army, is the unbelievable amount of treasure that's in this module. You have gold leaf on, around this pit that's worth 30,000 gold pieces over here. Uh, then you've got a pulpit that's sheathed in, it's worth 100,000 gold. You know, you've got this massive library that contains 100,000 volumes. Arneson says that it's 10% of all the books in the known world. And it contains maps to like really good treasure. 58,000 gold here, 50 gems there, and some unbelievable magic items. And in the high priest rooms, you've got a staff of withering, a dancing sword, a crystal ball. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Now, you have to have a high priest ring to get into this room, and there's only one of those, right? Otherwise, it sets off an alarm. Uh, individuals come running. And again, because there are so many of them, 
Uh, even if you, the players sneak in, they're probably going to have to get that high priest ring, which means they have to confront Steven. All right, so that's the basic concept, which I like. I like the idea of them breeding these killer frogs. It's in this cool location, you know, in this swamp, perpetual mist, difficult terrain. You have fanatical followers. I would just say to scale it back a little bit. I already talked about reducing the powers of Steven's battle suit. Uh, you know, the medical kit, maybe just getting rid of that. Uh, and maybe the teleport as well. But you can have Steven still be this, you know, alien or entity from another dimension who can disguise himself as a human. He arrives in the swamp because it was a nexus point, but he kind of looks around, there's this old temple maybe, and there's these, you know, this old decrepit cult that worships frogs, and he realizes, you know, I've got an opportunity here. So they've been, you know, pushed around by these bandits. They're a bunch of old geezers. Uh, Steven, you know, wipes them out. He gets his own riffraff that are loyal to him. Again, he has these rings that control people, but just not at the same scale. You know, what Steven wants to do after he eliminates his two partners and makes his other one the willing, you know, captain of the guard, is to spread his influence around Lake Gloomy, around the villages or towns. So he begins to breed the killer frogs, breed the frogmen. And he sends his bandits out to get, you know, townspeople and villagers to bring them in and create more frogmen. But it's just begun. You, you know, maybe start if you got 25 killer frogs, 25 frogmen, you know, maybe that many bandits, maybe five or six, you know, old, you know, priests that he controls. And in terms of these, you know, killer frogs, and where there's all sorts of tools online you can use to convert the monsters as they appear in Blackmore into 5e equivalents. Now, and you're going to have the rings, but just have like 10 rings, you know, same hierarchical structure. Stephen has the super control ring. Uh, and because they're more spread out, because you don't have as many, the players can interact with somebody and maybe get one of these, uh, you know, uh, underlings before they can, you know, alert people and get a ring and then slowly gain access. And it's not like they're just going to be wiped out if, you know, suddenly everyone just calls and hundreds of people arrive. And then, of course, you've got to reduce the treasure. You know, certainly the modern D&D isn't nearly the treasure, you know, horrors that you used to find in the old days. Uh, but, you know, you, you can have some treasure, and again, the battle suit, if it can be worn, this kind of thing, again, reducing its powers, that's going to be plenty. And then you decide how the players are going to get involved. Maybe, like, they're going out, they're kidnapping villagers, and somehow the players hear about this, or there are rumors of some great power arising in the swamps at Lake Gloomy. And the players, it's a sandbox campaign. If you don't make it urgent, if it's not someone they know or one of the players or something, they may ignore it. And then you can scale it. If the players hear about this at 6th or 7th and they don't do anything, and then they come back through at 9th and it's clearly more urgent, you know, bump up the abilities, you know, because Stephen the Rock has had a chance to build up his capabilities. And that's how you can use the concepts of this, which are so cool, you know, whether it's the alien thing, whether it's the killer frogs being bred, you know, kidnapping humans, the taste of human flesh. And the idea of betrayal and obsession and fanaticism, all within, you know, exploring. And then the dungeon underneath, you can use these maps and create something really cool. And if you like what you've seen, please subscribe to my channel. Always looking for more. Please leave some comments. I love to read them. And most importantly, keep playing D&D and tell somebody else about it.